It is a glorious day, and uh, I just want to thank everyone here for supporting the university, and in particular, I see a lot of our supporters of the School of Music, and uh, particular thanks to all of you who uh, help us do the good work that uh, John Schaefer is going to talk about. Um, I also want to thank you on behalf of the Foundation, the College of Letters and Science. Um, Dr. Schaefer is not only the director of the School of Music, but also a professor of music theory. And uh, for the last couple of years, we have been taking uh, the show on the road and uh, delivering the good message to other alumni around the country to let them know what's happening back at Madison and uh, talk about the great things about the school music. So without further ado, Dr. Schaefer. Thank you and, and welcome. Uh, I'm again John Schaefer. I'm the director of the School of Music. Been this is my beginning my 14th year as director. I've actually been on the faculty for 23 years as a music theorist and a technologist before that. Uh, and despite that, I still couldn't get this thing going really well. But I think, I think we're there. Uh, I just want to thank you all for coming out and, and to listening to what we have to say. And, and thank you to the foundation and everybody for helping put this together. Uh, let's see if I can make this technology work. There we go. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to begin on a historic note. Um, the School of Music is now beginning its what will be its 116th year in existence as a music program, offering a number of different uh, opportunities for the community. It started out as an independent conservatory, um, offering music instruction to the public. We had band and choir experience, individual instruction, but it was not at all affiliated with the university when it still came. Hence, it was the, the just called the School of Music or the Music Conservatory. Um, Interest was always strong in, uh, in what we were doing in terms of teaching, and it was probably about 1915 when the College of Letters and Science realized that so many of the college students were hungry for music teaching and training of some level, and they kept going over to the conservatory, and there was no affiliation. The conservatory, of course, could always benefit from being part of the university. So it was in 1915 when the original School of Music merged with the College of Letters and Science, and we became officially one of four professional schools within the college. The college is very large and has about 66 different programs, uh, but we are one of four professional schools. So we maintain the title School of Music, and I maintain a title of director since I'm not a dean, but I'm not really a chair either. So we, I sit somewhere in, in La La Land not quite knowing what, what to do or what's going on. Um, the school, of course, grew, and it grew very quickly once being affiliated with the university. It was probably around in 1939 when we started to gain some international notoriety. Uh, many of you have heard of the Pro Arte Quartet. It was in 1939 and 1940 when that quartet, which was the court quartet of the King of Belgium at the time, and had been touring Europe for about 20 years, got trapped here for the war, and negotiations took place and said, look, you need a place, you need a home, and we want to do something innovative. So it became the very first resident group of musicians or quartet in the world. Um, I'm actually very happy to say keep your eyes and ears open because next year begins the 100th anniversary of this quartet. It was founded sometime between 1911 and 1912, and, and depending on how you start counting, it's one or the other. But So we're going to look at a two-year centennial and doing a number of celebrations with the Pro Arte. Uh, they kicked off the season a little early, as John mentioned, at Carnegie Hall. We had a big concert with the Pro Arte Quartet. They are pulling together over $300,000 worth of commissioned new works, and we hope to premiere all of those at the Union Theater over the next couple years, and they're going to do a tour. We have gotten the people in Belgium very excited about this, and we have at least one Belgian composer who's going to commission works, and we're going to take them, hopefully, on an international tour. As far as we can tell, there is no other string quartet in the world that has performed continuously as one professional entity, albeit with different players, over a 100-year period. And this continues today uh, with such residencies. We had Gunnar Johansson. Many of you might have known him when he was around. Uh, we brought in the likes of Gunther Schuller, Midori, and other people who come in and spend a significant amount of time with our students. Uh, we not only have the opportunity, but we have one of the few institutions in the country that have three faculty ensembles besides the Pro Arte. There's the Wisconsin uh, brass Quintet and the Wingra Woodwind Quintet that are actually part of their responsibility is to do outreach to the state and they spend about a week out of each semester uh, as, as exchange for given load release time to practice and work as a quintet and they travel around and do, do things in, in far, far flung communities and schools um, all over the state and so that's a wonderful program that we have that almost nobody else does. 
Uh, we continue with a series of outreach and partnerships, and for some reason all the graphics I had up there didn't show up on that screen. It's what happens when I do it. Oh, there's one. Uh, we maintain a lot of different, oh, see, I copied another screen here. I'll just pop them until they all come up. But we partnership and the whole concept of outreach and part of the Wisconsin idea of taking what we do to the outer reaches of the state are very important. Uh, the Wisconsin Alumni Association, uh, we have the Wisconsin Youth Symphony Orchestra program is one of the largest and oldest and best run in the, in the country, and we're very strongly and tightly affiliated with that. Uh, we're working for years with Wisconsin Public Radio. They play many of our compositions, or you know, concerts that we do. We have the uh, Sunday at the Chazen does that. I'm, I'm proud to announce that uh, partly very soon I've been talking to people at Wisconsin Public Television and when and if we get our new buildings I'm going to talk to you about later, they want to set it up and start broadcasting over television many of the arts things we do across the state. So there's some wonderful partnerships, probably most uh, dear to me because it just finished is our summer music clinic, which is now celebrating, I think, 77 years in existence. And it brings over 1,000 high school and middle school kids onto our campus, each group for an entire week where they're absorbed in music, teaching and playing and making, and get to learn firsthand what it's like to be involved in a music school. So we're, we're very, very pleased about that. Today, our school of music, I'm happy to say, ranks in the top 3% of public music schools in the country. Uh, you know, rankings can be specious, but there's some that support this, so I'm, I'm very pleased about it. Uh, actually, the U.S. News and World Report ranked our master's program 19th in the country out of 700-some accredited schools. Uh, National Research Council ranked our doctoral program as being 8th out of all some 20-some doctoral, or 29, I think, doctoral programs in, in the country in music. So uh, we're very proud of what we do. Uh, as I think we do it very well. We have over 50 faculty, we have uh, 450 music majors, 22 professional staff, and at any given time we have almost 300 students on some kind of payroll. Uh, so it's a big operation and, and it's run very smoothly and we do it very well. Uh, as a result of that, of course, we do over 350 concerts and recitals every single year during the nine-month academic thing, which makes us the single largest presenter of classical music in the state of Wisconsin. And probably, if we weren't next to Chicago, I'd probably say Illinois too, but I, I don't think we can quite do that. But there's a lot of fabulous music making, and, and last year, for the first time, our, our prestigious faculty concert series went free. And we realized that we have a lot to give and a lot to offer, and it's not about trying to make money, it's about trying to offer it to the people. And so it was our gift to the community to say, you used to have a $10 ticket, there's no ticket price. And I'm happy to say that the attendance has almost doubled which has been wonderful. So we're going to do that again this year. We encourage people that if you can afford those ticket prices, give a donation through the foundation for what you would have paid for the tickets because it all goes to scholarship money. Uh, but nonetheless, it's been very successful for us and we're going to continue it. Um, we enjoy a great set of um, relationships with the upper administration, the community, the university. I think we're highly valued. Uh, we do offer a lot of things besides traditional music. You might not know that we have four orchestras, eight choirs, seven bands, two jazz ensembles, an Indian Indonesian gamelan orchestra, which you see there, world percussion ensembles, and about 50 other chamber groups, just to mention a few of them. Uh, also, in any given semester, we're offering over 700 accredited music courses, and we particularly invite non-majors to participate. Every one of our ensembles, right from our very best to our lowest, is open to any student in the university through audition. And some of our best players, in fact, are pre-med students or English majors, but so it's a very open community, and we get some wonderful, wonderful music making out of that. Well, the excellence of the School of Music has grown over the years. We have somewhat changed in what we do and how we do it. We are one of 10, we have 10 sister institutions in the state that offer music programs as well as ours. And we used to have a major forte was primarily training teachers. We were a music education school. Uh, the other nine schools continue to do that as their primary mission, but over the last 30 and 40 years uh, with the resident quartet and things and, and, and a desire to have a place where people can learn to be performers as well as teachers, uh, we've really morphed into primarily a performance school. Um, we haven't given up on music education. It's still very important, but it's, it's, uh, our music education students go out at a performance level that I think is higher than most of the other schools put forward. But right now, probably about 70 to 75% of our music majors define themselves as performers rather than music education majors. Uh, and so it's part of the reason we have uh, as many concerts as we do. If you can do a little simple math, Every doctoral student in performance, and we have almost 100 of them, has to do six recitals over two years. 
So you start to do that. That's about 200 recitals a year going on. And these are, these are musicians who are of a caliber who are ready to be professional musicians and can perform against some of the best. And so uh, if you have nothing to do any given Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday between 2 in the afternoon and midnight for April or May and part of, part of uh, March every year, come down and you'll find some incredible music making going on. And it's, again, it's all free. Let me jump ahead a little bit. Um, do you want to highlight a few a few of our success stories? Here, for example, um, some of our students to just show you, give you an idea of, of what we produce and what's going on. Bernard Scully uh, was one of our graduates, finished a, ma a master's degree in horn performance, was immediately auditioned by the Canadian Brass, which is probably the most known brass quintet in the world. Uh, they were going to put him on a nine-month trial period, and within two weeks, they said, forget it, you're so good, you're ours, we hired him. He did that for about two years and was hired as a principal horn player of St. Paul Chamber Orchestra, and given family and stability, he's now been hired to run the horn program at the University of Illinois, which is another one of the top one to two percent of public music schools in the country. So very, very successful individual. Uh, Felicia Moy is one of our new hires in violin. Um, she has, was first violinist with the Miami String Quartet, which in the 90s was winning international awards for the recording. She is also was the principal or co-principal violinist with the San Francisco Orchestra and principal violinist with the Santa Fe Opera. So she comes with quite a pedigree. Most recently, she was the head of the string program at the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. These are the kinds of faculty that we're able to attract. And uh, we're always looking, of course, for scholarship money because music students are being courted by many different schools, the best ones, and Felicia came and she thought without a lot of money she would lose most of her students, so she accepted about 25 students and 22 of them came. A normal load, full-time load for a faculty member is 15 students. So um, it's just a little example of, of what she can do with her success. Nate Stampley is one of our students, vocal student, who's now playing the Lion and the Lion King on Broadway. Uh, Laura Schwindiger was a recent uh, recipient of, of a Guggenheim Award. Um, Kit Taylor, of course, is making press all over the place. He's had more front page articles in the New York Times than any other Midwestern artist who is affiliated with the university. So he's beloved and doing, doing wonderful things. Um, um, other people we have, Kenny Jones is, is one of, was one of our base students, but he was also playing on the front line with the Badger football two years ago. So again, talk about one of the beauties of this university is a great research university. We have a lot of students who double major, and about a third of our students do a music major in something else, such as business, electrical engineering, pre-med, philosophy, or football. Uh, you know. <laughs> Julia Faulkner is, is uh, one of our new hires in, in voice, and of course she comes to us after many, many great performances on the Metropolitan Opera stage, and is one of another, like Felicia, who's drawing students uh, from just about everywhere. Given this, of course, we've earned the respect of our colleagues all over the country and all over the world, and we're finally developing a major pipeline of students in and out, and people who are going out to very successful uh, professional careers. Um, this you should probably all recognize. And we'll only talk about the good things uh, with the marching band. Um, but one of the things that I think makes us a great music school is unlike a conservatory like the Juilliard or New England Conservatories, they don't have a marching band. We do. <laughs> Uh, I'll do that just a little tongue in cheek, but actually, <laughs> I love the music band. It's part of what, we, or you know, marching band. It's part of what we do. It's about the most visible part of this university, and it's certainly the most visible part of the School of Music. When I travel around the state and people say, I'm with the School of Music, oh, I love your band. And I say, which one? Well, you know, the band, the band, Mike Lacrone, the band. <laughs> um, one of the most fun, I said, a little aside, the best stories it was the first year I was director, and Mike Lacrone, who is, you know, figured to be reckoned with, um, invited me as the new director to come to their band alumni party at the Concourse Hotel where they had almost 2,000 band members in there. And I was sitting there overwhelmed by these number of people. Um, the assistant band director at the time said, well, John, you know, we didn't think you would actually come. Why don't you get up and say something? <laughs> so I said, okay, I'll say a few words. And the assistant band director introduced me as the only person that Mike Lacrone has to call boss. So I took the moment, I seized it, and I walked up to the podium, I looked him straight in the eyes, and I said, and don't you forget it. <laughs> Unfortunately, I think he's forgotten it. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I'm, I'm getting ahead of myself here. Um, one of the things that's 
I'm beginning to allude to is about our school is it's unique. It's not just better. Um, everybody can be better than somebody else, and you don't get anywhere by just pretending you're good. But what we have in Madison is a unique combination that includes world-class music instruction and music making, a world-class research university, and as you look out these windows, a place that's matched by almost no other place other than maybe Boulder, uh, where you'd actually want to live. You put the three together, I think we have a powerful combination. Uh, the future of our students is going to rely very heavily not on getting an orchestra job because there are not many of those, but it's going to be on having an entrepreneurial view of the world and going out and carving a place for yourself. Um, if it means finding a career as an electrical engineer where you play at night, so be it. That's fine. I often like to tell people that if you go out and remain and maintain as an active avocational musician, you'll probably touch more people in more ways than a professional musician ever will. You play in the symphony, you've got the same group of people coming in week after week after year after year, but the person who's playing in a community band, community orchestra, playing in a wedding band, jazz band, whatever, he's touching more people in many ways, and I think we value that greatly. So we really do try to promote that if you're looking for a great music education where you get the breadth of a world-class research university and a great place to live, I'm very hard-pressed to find more than one or two examples anywhere else in this country where you can do that, um, and I think it is a great place. That being said, of course, we still have a future, something to think about. Um, yeah, there we go. My pages didn't print out correctly. Picture in your mind a world-class UW scientist in their state-of-the-art laboratories. Labs must be constructed with proper heating, cooling, ventilation, functional work surfaces, and the like. Performance space is a musician's laboratory, the other instrument they must learn to master. To be a truly professional musician, a person must learn to make the music, the best music in a professional performance space. How a musician uses space is just as important as the mechanics of an instrument, whether that instrument's a voice, string, woodwind, percussion, or a combination of something brand new. One would not think twice about the need for a good musician to perform on an excellent instrument, yet we're totally willing too many times to ask them to perform in acoustic spaces that are far inferior to the quality of what they're doing as musicians. A performance venue to us is an extension of a musician's instrument, and to properly train and record these musicians, we need a fitting environment to support them. And speaking of problematic spaces, I thought I'd throw, oh, there's our, um, talking about our humanities building with its uh, shrinking spaces. Uh, that was a little gimmick somebody did with the orchestra because my next lead in is that the humanities building has served us for 40 years but it served us very poorly and that when you put the entire orchestra on that stage we're in violation of fire code <laughs> so we either need to shrink the orchestra or do something about a, a different building like i say we've been in that um, building for over 40 years and it's starting to run down a little bit of life in the trenches What's poignant about the little picture on the left is that's a fire alarm. And of course, so the water is leaking through the roof and coming through the walls and staining and eating up the paint. And I'm sure what it'll do when it shorts out the fire alarm and either we have the fire department or worse yet, we have no fire alarm. Uh, that's the glass, which they said the building's so hard to clean, they clean our windows every 10 years. And, and what you're seeing there is probably five years worth of collected bugs, et cetera on there. Um, certainly we, we have more. Our building was built for a program about half our size, so every hallway is filled with, with certain things. This is my favorite picture. Uh, there was a rotted staircase on the outside of the building, so they tore it down and let it sit there for a, a week, and somebody came along and decided they better put a stairs closed sign on it, because <laughs> the building is so falling apart that people might actually think it's still a functional staircase. So. Fortunately, we are planning new performance centers and ultimately a new school of music, uh, something that we think we can not only sh work with our students to give them the spaces we need, but to share with the community as well. And as John mentioned, we're sort of starting to go on the road looking for support to try to build new facilities. I mean, one of the questions is, why do it now? Obviously, there are so many compelling reasons. With the school poised and where it is professionally, um, you know, we have very poor sound quality in the in the rooms it's all detrimental to being able to train the students it's not audience friendly anybody who stumbled down the stairs in, in mills will know or tried to f sit your derriere into one of the seats in morphine either one of them works quite well um, you know it, it's just simply not an experience 
that's, that's worthy of what we need to do. There are beautiful spaces in town, such as the Overture Center, and a number of people sit there and say, well, why, you know, we have this gorgeous place downtown. Why don't you just use the Overture Center and take advantage of that? Well, there's a couple reasons. One of them, there's 2,300 seats there, and when our average audience is between 100 and 300, that doesn't work. A more compelling cost is the last time we went in there, the total bill was close to $29,000 for one days of concerts and rehearsals in that space. There's a Capitol Theater. We could do that. It seats between 800 and 1100. Still too big, but it, it only costs about seven or eight hundred thousand dollars by the time you're done. And there's not exactly a lot of time left. You think go back to the math on 350 concerts and recitals a year, and I have a, a budget of zero for putting on concerts. It's it's just simply not going to work. They're the wrong size, wrong shape, and we're never really designed to fit our our needs for what we need to do. Um, what we're looking at is building a set of halls that will be totally complementary uh, to what goes on down the hall, down down the street. Um, when the Overture Center was built, one of the study teams sat there and said, "What this city needs most is a medium-sized, six to eight hundred seat music hall designed for that." But it wasn't part of the final plan because it's just not economically feasible. It doesn't seat enough to generate the income, and so. Um, there are a number of groups. How many of you have gone to concerts out at Oakwood Village or in churches or basements here and there? There's a whole community of people in hundreds of places. Wouldn't it be wonderful actually to have one place where we could gather together almost all of the, the groups in town doing classical music and put them in a space with an 800-seat hall and a 350-seat recital hall and say, we use this, but this is open to the community, and the cost is what it costs to turn the lights on, not $10,000, and, and create a synergy. I would love for the, everybody to come down on University Avenue seven days a week and see lights on in this space and say, wow, that's where you go. And when you want to hear something, you hear about a concert with some group in town, the first thing that comes to mind, I better check the university website because that's probably where they're going to be. We have not really done much architecturally on this plan. We're still not there yet, but this was one little rendering to show you what it might look like. I put it there because it looks pretty, but it really doesn't tell me anything at all about, about what's happening <laughs> with the facilities. This might give you a little better picture of the, of the long-term plan. And this is a, a priority for the campus. It's on the campus master plan, and the state has approved it. We're just waiting uh, for funding to build it. You can see University Avenue running along the bottom of that picture. The red block is where the new concert halls will go. The blue square is what's currently under construction is the addition to the Chazen Museum. Uh, what's north of that red block or going up on the screen is currently the UW Extension Building. Uh, but the Humanities Building is about more than concert halls. It's about rehearsal spaces and studios and offices and a place for all of these students to live. You know, we have 100 practice rooms, and they're the size of most of your spare bedroom's bathroom. I think they measure about six by eight feet. And these students will often live in these rooms for four to eight hours a day, seven days a week for four years. And, and in the humanities building, it's, it's a pretty dismal place to have to live. So the long-term plan is to remove the extension building and build an entire new school of music building uh, up from that. We're only worrying about phase one at the moment, which is the concert halls, because again, instructionally, I think those are the most acute thing. Now, it hasn't, it hasn't been without its problem. <laughs> we don't have a building yet, but we finally have acquired the land. If any of you paid any attention to the press in town, you know, this is a, uh, the university owned the entire lot except for the corner with the bar and the bar. I think was thinking that people would rather have a bar than a school of music, and I, some of them probably did, but uh, this was one of their efforts to rally the troops. Uh, unfortunately, they actually had a student come in to me in my office and wanted me to call the police because she was afraid that this would get people so incensed that they would attack students in the School of Music. But anyways, it's resolved. We own the property. The bar is still there leasing it from the university. Or I should say lease it. I'd love to lease it from the School of Music, but that, that would be a little too. And, and they have a lease, so they will be there until at which point we are able to break ground. Um, I'm doing what I do best, which is going freeform and completely losing my track and where we are. Um, again, a little bit about the spaces. The science of acoustics has changed incredibly over the years. And one of my conceptions for these new spaces, the, what, again, what I call an 800-seat orchestra hall, which means it's not a proscenium theater. It's not a multi-use. It's a room that's designed acoustically for live music and nothing more and nothing less, and it will be a beautiful space, and then a 350-seat multifunction 
uh, recital hall, where, which will become the workhorse for the school. But I, I, I hesitate to call these concert halls because that gets me in trouble. That's when people say, well, we have the Overture Center and, and concerts. The School of Music is not in the business of doing concerts. We're in the business of training our students. And the process of performing and learning to work and perform in a space and perform in front of people under pressure is an integral part of that training. Uh, so to that extent, even if nobody came to these concerts, it's important that people do it. Uh, so that's one of the things. But many of you, or I don't know how many of you buy classical music, but you might find it's harder and harder and harder to find a recording of anything you want to listen to. Or if you find it, there might be 50 recordings of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony, but try to find a copy of Beethoven's Second Symphony and it's pretty hard. As you know, the recording industry is having terrible times, even with popular music. The classical music recording industry has completely imploded and gone away. Uh, something you may not know, but it was never, uh, it was always on a for-profit thing, but classical music never made money for a record company ever, and for the most part it was done when it was considered a prestige issue, and so record companies would subsidize the classical music just as they subsidize their news shows now. And, and, and at some point, it became financially infeasible to do that. There are companies like Naxos that will distribute music, but they don't produce it. They don't record it. You do all the work and bring them a finished recording, and they will market it for you. And that's about where it is. But I thought, you know, if we're in the top 3% of schools, and we have people who are performing at a level that, that you should come and hear them and close your eyes, and you will think you're hearing professional musicians in a major city. It's just it's stunning. Uh, why not record these? We actually do record most of our groups. But I think there's a move afoot, and I want to be in the front end of this, that universities with good schools of music will become the primary producers, generators, and distributors of the recorded art form. By whatever means it's distributed, you know, we're in a world, a big research university, so whatever they'll figure out, we'll be able to do it. But it's, it's you know, one of the ideas with public television said, let's make sure that what we have is world-class recording studios with seats in them so that the audiences can come and enjoy it and love it, but we can actually produce the music with the students and, and distribute it and find a way so that we become the, the archives. And this is, this is a model going all over the country. There's a major study at Harvard talking about the arts and humanities and said universities need to embrace the arts and humanities like they never have before. Sciences have a home and can live outside a university, but for the most part, the arts and humanities live in the university, and so we need to take, take control of these things and, and you know, go after it. Um, one of the things that I think that's it's nice is, uh, again, we, we can do this on a not-for-profit basis, that through the university and through the goodness and, and talent of the students, we're in a position uh, to do that. Well, the time is now. Um, again, we're working, I'm proud to say, we announced that we have more, almost half of the cost of this building covered. We have $20 million in gifts, or almost $21 million in gifts towards a $42 million project. Um, we're still looking for another $21 million, so if you feel moved today, <laughs> John will meet you by the door. Uh, but please do, you know, we're, we're, we're always ready and anxious. We believe this will work. The economy has slowed it down a little bit, but we keep trying. So, you know, if, if, you, if you're willing and interested in giving or you know people you think might be interested and be touched by something, this is certainly let us know because we're, um, we're at a point where we're trying to just throw out a wide net and cast and find as many people as we can. Um, if you want to know more about the School of Music or keep up to date on what's going on with the business and things, please come to our website. It's a, it's a good, nice, active website. Uh, most of you, I trust, have some sort of Internet access. One of the things that um, I think I'm most proud about on this one is this right here. Along this idea of presenting people music if they can't come to a concert hall, we started recording and streaming on the Internet. Most of our major concerts have been doing this for about four years. I'm happy to say if you go there right now, there's probably upwards of 200 hours of live recorded music available for free. And if you've got a computer with Internet access, you go to our web page and go to the calendar, and any event you see in there has a little speaker next to it. You click on that speaker, and you can listen to the entire concert in your living room at home, wherever it is you want to listen to it. It's all free. It's all there. Uh, it's a little bit of a model that we hope will expand in the future to where people from all over the world, if they're looking for Beethoven's second, they know they can come to a university website and find the darn thing. Um, or, or other pieces, you know, as a university, we're often pushing the boundaries of what is done. And so we have many things recorded and available on there that have never, never seen the light of a commercial recording ever in their life. And, and I'm proud of that. We also have a CD store, if you still like to get a CD in a nice box. 
Uh, we, we produce a number of our own recordings, and many of our faculty have professional recordings, and you go to that web store, it's got the little shopping cart, the whole bit, and I think we have over 90 titles available featuring our artists, faculty, and students on that website. So please visit that anytime you have a chance. And again, thank you for joining us and listening to what I have to say. I thought rather than talking for 50 minutes, it might be more fun if you had questions or things you want to ask me. I'm here for the duration and would be more than happy to talk to you about anything you'd like to hear. So with that, I'll open the floor for comments, questions, and things. Yes, sir. Thank you for that question. If you didn't all hear it, he said he was traveling in Europe and many buildings are built for 700 years and how come we're tearing down buildings that have only been around for 40, 50 years? Um, and the question was, did they really think that they would be torn down in 40 years? And the answer is actually yes. And as I understand it, I would like to say I'm young enough, I wasn't there, but uh, there was a whole post-war building boom where the need for to, to service students was there and there wasn't the money to build these 700-year buildings then. And the attitude, as I've been explained to me, was let's build something quick and easy now, and we won't build to last because in 30 or 40 years, then we'll have the money, and then we can go back and do it right. So what's happening is a university actually has many buildings built in the first half of the century that they're renovating completely, keeping those buildings. The things that are coming down are the things built in the 50s and 60s and 70s because they literally were not built to last more than about 40 or 50 years. I mean, that's a sad state of affair for education and the whole concept of a building. Um, so to that extent, I mean, I would love to go through the litanies of what doesn't work with the humanities building, but uh, <laughs> but, but it's, it's, it's reached the point where fixing it is far more expensive than what it would take to build a new one. Uh, these new halls will be 700-year halls, I promise you that. There's, uh, the question, of course, is what, what is our time frame on these buildings if we get them? There are two phases to the project. The first is the concert halls, which will be built together at the same time. The second is everything else that belongs in the School of Music. And it was partly put into two phases because the state was not real interested in putting money into arts facilities. But they are at least sharing part of the cost on normal instructional buildings. So the thought was maybe if we build the first half all by ourselves, that they'll come along and build a second half all by themselves. Um, we don't know that the second f phase is very far off because there's already a UW extension building there. There's no new building for them. They have to be relocated new buildings and that's probably 30 or 40 million dollars. So that's in the dream plan. The concert halls will start and be triggered by the remainder of giving and gifts. Uh, once we obtain about 90 percent of the money available or needed for the building, it triggers things into motion. At that point, it will take between six to nine months to develop a set of building plans and to put out bids for contractors, and then ground will be broken, and it will take about two years to build the halls. So if, some of, if somebody handed me a check today for the other $21 million, it would be about three years to three and a half years before they would be built. Um, but because of the state regulations, we have to have the money in hand before we can let out a contract to build the building. Um, so, so when that three-year window triggers in, is completely predicated on when gifts come in to allow us to build the buildings. Yes. Sure. The question, of course, is about the, the decrease in funding for music education in our schools, and it's something that's getting worse and acute. It has had an impact across the state. Um, our music education program has gotten smaller as our performance program got bigger because we have, if I have 50 faculty and they each have room for 15 to 18 students, you have a fixed number. And so when one program grows, the other has to shrink by nature. But I would say the last two or three years, we've had a significantly greater difficulty in placing our students into schools, uh, partly because the jobs suddenly are not there. And I would say at this point, we, we used to talk about that we were only training half the music students we needed for the next 10 years, and we needed to ramp up. But the fact is these programs are getting cut so fast that there's now more students on the market than there are jobs. And unless we can turn something around, um, that, that does not bode well. Uh, more insidious to me 
is that in looking with fewer people to do more things in music, um, the schools are sort of, or the, the K through 12 schools are looking to sort of dumb down the competency level of the music education teacher. In Wisconsin, we used to have five certification tracks, elementary, instrumental, secondary, instrumental, elementary, choral, secondary, choral, and general specialist. We're now down to two of them, which is instrumental, birth to death, and choral, birth to death. And about half the states in the country now have it down to one certification, which is everything birth to death. And of course, you haven't increased the amount of educational time. It still takes these students actually five years to get through this program because they have four years of music and a full year of certification training. And so students are going out very, very ill-prepared to do this. What the schools want is said, okay, well, if we've, we've lost our choral teacher and we can't hire someone yet, so maybe the band director can go in and teach the choir for a little bit. And, and we're guaranteeing a level of mediocrity that was never there before. Hopefully our students, I think we take pride that our students are very good and they're still able to handle that. Uh, so it's maybe not quite as dire, but uh, you look in California systems and they got rid of school music altogether in the schools. So now parents who want their student training, uh, trained in music have to do after school programs supported by fees from the parents. And, and I have to say, we're actually beginning conversations with WISO, the Wisconsin Youth Symphony Orchestra program, about trying to plan into the future. What happens if the Madison public school system decide that uh, the entire string program is gonna disappear? What position can we be and should we be in to step in and take that over? And the notion of a community music school um, to me is a very powerful notion where we take our best faculty or, and more important, our best graduate students, give them an opportunity to teach and work in these settings. But you know, there's a lot of money that's involved in that thing. But I, I promise you we'll be there when something goes, but it's, it's not a pleasant picture. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Bascom Hill or Bascom? <laughs> music, music Hall. Music Hall was built in, I think, 1870. It's gone through major renovations, and I think that building will last forever because it was designed to last forever. You know, it's gotten so old and ornery that we had that, well, you see that clock? It was about six years ago. That entire clock got blown out by a lightning strike, and lightning hit the tower and blew out all four clock faces. The university was good enough to replace them with beautiful clocks. And kind of, When I saw the gash, how that lightning went through a couple of 10 by 10 inch beams, and yet it refused to burn. And the fire department says, oh, we cannot conceive why this thing didn't burn. And I said, it just didn't want to. It's just there. It just doesn't want to. You know, it's actually, even with the new music halls we're talking about, uh, what many people don't realize is that if, if you're a singer, an operatic singer, your voice really doesn't come into maturity until your later 20s. So most of the students who study opera will destroy their voices if they sing in a large hall. And Music Hall at 350 seats is the perfect size for our students, and so we continue to do our opera productions in that space and will for a long time. Um, you know, it needs a few more bathrooms, a few more elevators, everything else, and, and the bats that come flying from the ceiling sometimes are entertaining, but for the most part, we don't want the bats there, but that, we'll, we'll deal with that one, so, yeah. Yes, Amy? He does. John Harbison, if many of you may or may not know, he's, he's an, an institute professor at MIT. He's probably one of the top 10 leading American, living American composers. His, uh, was only two uh, composers at, by the time in 1999, he was commissioned by the Metropolitan Opera to do the Great Gatsby Opera. It was the, only the second time in 90 years that the Metropolitan Opera had commissioned contemporary opera. He's, he's in demand all over the world, and he has a, his wife is an alum of our school, Rosemary Harbison, a very accomplished violinist, and they have a family farm just past the airport in the little town of Token Creek. And I should invite you all, if you want a marvelous experience, the last week of August, they hold the Token Creek Chamber Music Festival and bringing in people from all over the world to perform. It's done in a barn that's converted to a house and lovely stuff. But, you know, John Harbison, because of the association with the university or knowing myself, my wife is willing to come and we've done, I did a class on his string quartets and he came in on a number of days and spoke personally with the students, gave master classes for relatively small cost. You know, you can look at a, someone like a Midori or Yo-Yo Ma comes in and it might cost the Madison Symphony $60,000 to bring them in as an artist. 
the faculty that are in our school are so well known and renowned themselves that they're good buddies with these kinds of people. So it's very common for me to get somebody on our faculty, John Ailey will come and he said, you know, the American Brass Quintet's coming through Chicago for a Friday and Saturday concert and they're bored, they have nothing to do. And if we could just get them $400 for gas money, they would love to come up and spend Saturday doing classes for our students. And I said, you got that $400, I'll pull it right out of my own wallet. And so I keep a, a stash of money and it's probably the best money I will ever spend for doing those kinds of opportunities. So people like John and others are there is that because we have an affiliation with such known artists, they're willing to do that for almost nothing. Oh. John has honorary degrees from the Madison School. Yes, he does, an honorary doctorate. So, yeah. And those don't come easy. She had one more question. You mentioned the overture tenor and song. What about the work the Union Theater? How does that play into the, the past? <laughs> Union Theater. Union Theater, the question, what about it, and how does it work into all of this? Uh, we have very strong collaboration with the Union Theater. Um, they, of course, do something like 200 events a year. And only six or eight of them are actually classical musical events. But to that extent, we've begun to collaborate because as their audiences shrink, their hall is too big. Some of you may know in a year, in two years, they're closing that theater down for two years to renovate it. And one of the conversations is, what do we renovate it into? Because it's not been very successful in music hall. We've already worked on a mutual agreement that when we build our new concert halls, all of the classical music events that the union puts on their program will take place in our space. And so at some point, we're, we're looking to kind of unify that function and again say, if it's about art music and acoustic music of any kind and shape, we have the place and we'll do it and we'll work with anybody. So that's, that's what will likely happen over time. They will continue to do their world music things and, and they, do, they do a lot of lecture series, travel series, and those will continue to go on. And, yeah. I think it's, you know, it's saving through consolidation and if the building's there, you might as well keep it going 20 hours a, a day. All right, I think that's it for questions. I'll be around if you have other questions, but thank you for your time. Thank you very much, John, um, for that lovely presentation.